Hey. So, welcome. Bawat lom, Kate Mila Falsha, a Korov, Quig Karen Goliva. So, I'd like to welcome to the 21st McGill International Entrepreneurship Com Conference Industry Forum uh, 2017. Uh, the McGill Industry Forum is a key component, a main event of the McGill International Entrepreneurship Conference. Um, so, really, this is our first day of a conference, and this event really kicks off the main conference, which will uh, be over the next two days. Um, I just want to um, thank Portishead um, to offer us this venue, which is such an ideal setting. Um, Portishead is the flagship innovation centre for the Galway Innovations uh, District, which is the first one in Galway. So, um, thank you so much, uh, Mary Rogers, for offering us to use this venue. And I'll let you talk about it in a few minutes. Um, just to give, um, some of you would not be familiar with the McGill International Entrepreneurship Conference. Um, uh, this is the first time um, it's been uh, hosted um, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, hosted by NUI Galway. So we're, we're delighted with the opportunity. And we're, I'm delighted to say we have a co-founder of the McGill Co International Entrepreneurship Conference here tonight, Professor ha Hamid Etmad, who's sitting there. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to host this conference. This conference equally has brought together, um, for this conference, 81 delegates from over 20 countries in the world. So you're all sitting here tonight, uh, most of you are, um, from Canada, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland. So it's, it's grown in the last two decades, and particularly the study of international entrepreneurship really has grown in the last two decades uh, in, in areas of academia. But we know that international entrepreneurial ventures have been around long before that, such as Honda. Um, so the, the, the study of why we, we have become to focus on this area in the last two decades is that we're really looking at born globals, which are those new ventures who look at the marketplace from day one of inception or even before. We're looking at international startups, global startups, low-tech, medium, high-tech startups, um, export-orientated new companies, medium-sized companies that see the world and are very much export-orientated and see their markets outside their economy. And it's quite prominent and common in the countries like uh, Ireland, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, um, UK, uh, and um, Italy, and parts of Spain as well. So it's, it's become particularly pertinent to um, Ireland in this research. But as researchers, we're, we're foremost educators, teachers, and the more we research and understand how companies in the area of international entrepreneurship Earthship operate, we can teach better, we can research better, and also we can inform policy as well. Um, the industry forum evening, evening um, examines um, really the discussion between academics and industry, and it's all really about industry tonight and, academ and academics, researchers, and scholars. Um, there, before I really go at, outline the kick into the schedule, I'm going to introduce you to Mary Rogers who's going to tell you a little bit about Portishead, and then we'll get on track, okay? Hi, everyone. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the board of the Portishead, myself, the Innovation Community Manager, and my colleague, Ashling. Uh, you're all very welcome here tonight. The entrepreneurship journey for the Portishead began about... 24 to two and, two and a half years ago, when John Breslin, who you'll hear from later, found this unloved building. It had 34 rooms. It was in, run down and left empty for eight years. And the board, together with our sponsors and the support of Enterprise Ireland, uh, renovated it into this co-working space. So we opened in May 2016 with 24 members. We now have 71 full-time members and uh, members from all over the world. So we have 14 different countries based here from Estonia, Russia, Holland, Austria, like all over. So it's fantastic to have that peer-to-peer -peer networking. And that's what's key to the Portershed and that's part of our ethos here. 
We also recently launched an accelerator, NDRC at Portershed. This is the first regional accelerator outside of Dublin, and we'll take 30 companies through a 100-day program over the next 18 months. And the outcomes of that will create jobs and create sustainable companies so that our children and the entrepreneurs in the room here and graduates will have an opportunity to live and work in Galway City. And again, that was with the support of Enterprise Ireland and in partnership with them. So a key for us is job creation. It's fundamental to our ethos. Um, but most importantly, the Portershed is more than a building. It's a community. And so the building is just a place. But at that table, conversations happen. And uh, I always joke that at lunchtime, you'll hear conversations about AI or data analytics. And in the afternoon, emails will go around the room with links to different articles. And so it's fantastic for people who love that, bitcoins and all those conversations, to be able to discuss that with your peers. If you're a company with two people and you're working from home or from a cube or from someone remotely, you don't have that accessibility. So here at the Portershed, we try to facilitate, provide access, link, and help these scaling tech companies grow. So you're very welcome to be part of our community tonight, and we hope that we'll continue the relationship going forward. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask myself or Ashling. And uh, thanks so much, Natasha, for bringing the event here this evening, and I hope you all have a great conference. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Okay, uh, I just want to also just add before we go, I probably wouldn't be standing here this evening. I'd be all over the place. It wasn't for... Everyone look over this way. Um, where's Philip as well? Is Philip? He's back there. So Brian, um, who's done Trojan work, even in the last 10 minutes, <laughs> hasn't stopped. Gabriella, Dr. Abigail Gliga, um, Rachel Igersol, um, and also Philip Stevens, which is keeping an eye on things over there, keeping an eye on the food. Uh, and also, thanks so much, um, Adrian, um, for um, Larkin for coming here to do the tweets. Um, so um, just the out outline you can see in this booklet here, I just want to make, um, a, a, I don't know if Paul Agnum here, is Paul here yet? Okay, just a quick apology in terms of the, this bit of a print, but Paul's Agnum's um, uh, profile has, has, has been, it's been, we actually printed it out again, so it's actually in your, it's a page, you get a page with your booklet this evening which is a correct profile. We also, um, Barry O'Sullivan from Alto Cloud couldn't make it this, e this evening, but we're delighted to welcome David Stafford, um, the Chief Financial Officer from Alto Cloud as well, and we've also added your profile as well in the booklet. So just the structure of this evening, um, we have two industry panels, um, the well, which is addressed the discussion theme. The, ch the first one is challenges in born global business planning for international growth. Um, we I'm delighted and I'm really grateful that we have our panel, um, Barry Egan from Enterprise Ireland, Regional Director, Dr. Adrian Boyle from Catex Limited, which is a marine technology um, young born global company. We have Deirdre E. Cop Whale um, from Renamara in, in marine also, but seaweed uh, cosmetics and marine um, um, cosmetics space, so very important cosmetics. And we also have David Stafford from the Chi uh, from Alto Cloud. And a special, special thanks to Dr. Sharon Lone, who's going to take over from me and do all the hard work. Um, so I'm delighted we have a real sample of born global uh, entrepreneurs here tonight so we can learn from. And I'll leave it over to you, Sharon. I, I should also say, Sharon is. Professor of International Business and Entrepreneurship in the University of Ulster. I know you so well, that's why I'm just, it's like a conversation we would have. Um, in the University of Ulster, and Sharon is also head of the Department of International Business and Strategy in the University of Ulster. She is probably one of the top scholars, in addition to many people here in the room, um, in this field um, of international entrepreneurship, and also might add as well, this is the only conference in the world that focuses on international entrepreneurship as a key area in, in research and, and teaching. Um, so thank you, Sharon. I'm delighted and privileged to have you to moderate the panel. Okay. Thank you, Natasha, and welcome delegates and welcome to our distinguished panel. Um, before we start, I suppose, I see Professor Etimad sitting down there. 
And it brought me right back to my first McGill conference with my PhD supervisor, Professor Jim Bell, that many of you knew. And up until then, I was a very grown up PhD candidate at that stage, rather mature. And I was so looking forward to this conference, as Natasha says, the only one that concentrates on this particular niche area that we all love so well. And I was exposed for the very first time to an industry panel like this. And Professor Atamad had brought in um, four or five entrepreneurs, and it was like touching the Holy Grail to touch real born global entrepreneurs. <laughs> it was just, whoa. It was one of the defining moments of my life. I tell you now, Hamid, that immediately the panel was over, I collared one of the fellas in the lift, and I went out and interviewed him near the airport the next day. So <laughs> thank you for that. That was one more respondent for the PhD. So maybe run when we're finished here. <laughs> um, the purpose of our panel today is to identify the opportunities and challenges regarding planning for born global internationalization. I thought this was particularly interesting about planning, um, which is, I suppose, very tightly interwoven with decision making and with opportunity recognition and maybe even networks, or do you plan at all? I've been fighting with myself the whole way in the car from Enniskillen, where I live, about planning and small companies. So I suppose the first thing we could start off is getting a little context. Perhaps I could ask our entrepreneurs just in turn to give us a quick pen picture, a quick few words or a few lines about your company. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is David Stafford, and CFO at AltaCloud. AltaCloud was launched um, three years ago, March 2014. Um, the, the, the initial... Um, reason why Altitude was launched, our founders were ex were Cisco employees, the call center area, and they wanted to bring the call centers into the 21st century. Um, and today Altitude um, makes call center agents smarter and customers happier. And that's by bringing the web journey to the call center agent so that when the phone is picked up, they can say, hi Barry, you're renewing your car insurance and it cuts out the press one for this, press two for that, 10 minutes explaining what you need them to do. So in the last uh, three years, we've raised uh, five million euros in financing. We have a sales office in Mountain View in California. We have 22, uh, 19 engineers, uh, sales and marketing, uh, finance, so we've 22 employees here in the Portershed, uh, two in California, um, so we're an Irish company, R&D based here, sales and marketing in the States, and I suppose from the beginning we were thinking global, and, and so we thought about it from the start. Great to hear from a born global, thank you David. Deirdre. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Deirdre Cahuil. I'm CEO of Rina Mara Irish Seaweed Cosmetics. Um, our company is a born global SME. Our journey began in 2002. Uh, we spent two years research and development throughout Europe, uh, mainly looking at the seaweed industry. Because seaweed is such a natural resource and it's underutilised here in the west of Ireland, we wanted to harvest the seaweed so that we'd have the full benefits of the minerals and the vitamins and to add it to uh, skincare products. Um, like the former speaker, we wanted uh, an international company. From the beginning, we wanted uh, it to be a global brand. And our R&D then uh, took us throughout Spain, France, Italy, throughout Europe to look at other international uh, cosmetic companies, to look at the beauty industry and to look at organic products and to see how they were expanding globally and how we could build that into our marketing plan um, and also uh, generate sales and the different sales ch channels and opportunities that would be there for us. Uh, so this was an important part of our research for the first two years. We then launched Rina Mara, um, our seaweed cosmetics, in January 2004. And uh, we've expanded into new markets maybe six months after our initial um, inception. Thank you. Okay, I have one here. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Adrian Boyle. I'm the CEO and founder of Catholic Ocean. 
Um, we started Catholic Ocean in 2009, actually in Galway of all places. Uh, we visited the Marine Institute. They had what we call a remotely operated vehicle. You might have seen it um, up in Mayo recently when they were searching for the uh, victims in the 116 crash. So uh, remotely operated vehicles are typically cost about 5 million euro. Um, and we develop and build imaging systems for them. But the key business and what we identified on day one was that they moved very, very slowly. They used video cameras. Um, and the boats that carried these cameras out cost anywhere between 100,000 per day and 500,000 per day. And without knowing where it was going to go, we invested in and developed a camera system that actually allowed those ROVs and boats to move up to 10 times faster. And the key is that somewhere in that, somebody was going to save a lot of money. Uh, so what we do is we allow the ROVs to go faster, and we also then process that data, and we automate it so that we take the people out of the equation and get real-time information. So we started in 2009. Uh, today we, have, uh, we, we're, we operate globally, but our, our headquarters is in Ireland. We have um, an office, a sales office in Boston. Today alone, we've had calls with Angola, we've had calls with Perth in Australia, Rio de Janeiro, Houston, um, and also with Singapore. And we go, literally, one of our systems is worth a few hundred thousand today, but in the industries we're in, there is only around 5,000 of these underwater vehicles. But our main proposition, and some of the challenges, and when I talked to um, Natasha about this, uh, you know, the theme and how, how we operate, we, all we knew on the day one was that we were going to save an awful lot of money for people who paid for boats. But our business challenges have been how do we then offer the product and how do we sell it and commercialize it. Um, and as a scientist and as a, as a non-financial person, I had to navigate from there to where we are today. We're still not absolutely out of the water. I think we've an awful long, long way to go still. But we've got some things right. We've made some mistakes. And we can share more of those as we go through this session. Maybe. Thank you, Adrian. And Barry, perhaps, <clears throat> as being from Enterprise Ireland, you could tell us a little bit how Enterprise Ireland sits in the ecosystem of support agencies, particularly for those of the delegates who are not from Ireland. Sure, Sharon. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome to Galway. Um, Enterprise Ireland, we're a semi-state government organisation, and we're responsible for the development of Irish companies in global markets. So global is fundamental to what we do. Um, we've got a, an overseas, a network outside of Ireland of 32 offices, and we, we have, I suppose, two main um, areas of activity. We, have, we deal with about 5,000 Irish companies that are all export orientated. We have two here this evening. And our job is right to support those companies to grow and develop and win business. Secondly, we're also supporting the growth of ambitious entrepreneurs with global ambitions. And we call those um, people high potential startups. So a startup that by the end of year three will employ more than 10 people, will turn over over a million euros and export. So we're, we're in that space and we partner in every county in Ireland. There's a, a, a local enterprise office and, and we support a system of 30 two local enterprise offices around the country um, you know, to support people to get up to 10. But we deal with entrepreneurs that want to employ more than 10. So they're the two domain areas that we work with. Existing companies that are exporting, that want to export, and then we're dealing with high growth entrepreneurs. And then in, in addition to that then, we also are very active in supporting the ecosystem for risk money. And I could talk for a long time on that. We also support um, the ecosystem in terms of space. And Mary has said, this facility here is one of about 120 that we supported in communities all around Ireland. We also have supported the development of incubators on each of the, each of the 15 campuses of Institutes of Technology. And we've also supported um, incubators on each of the campuses of universities. So we support the availability of high quality space for, for enterprise. And that we also support the innovation ecosystem, ensuring that Ireland is, is developing new technologies that is globally competitive, that both existing companies and startups can take that technology and make money out of. So I suppose that's very simply uh, you know, what Enterprise Ireland is about. Thank you, that was very comprehensive and very um, succinct actually because um, Enterprise Ireland is such a huge organisation covering so many areas. I think we've already heard quite a lot about planning even in the intros 
um, from the entrepreneurs. Deirdre, I was really interested listening to you about you talked about the run-up to the company before you actually started to trade and about the planning. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, exactly what you were investigating and planning and how you actually funded that time? Um, funding is difficult at that point, uh, you know, especially when you have to travel and you have to gain all this knowledge that you don't maybe necessarily have. You know, your market research, you know, into the different markets. Um, so basically we funded it ourselves, it was our own funding. And um, I mean, at that point we were uh, looking at from formulations to ingredients to, uh, which was important because when you're going into new markets, uh, there's different legislation. There's an EU cosmetic directive, which is fine for the EU, but when you go to um, export into America, there's FDA approval. And, uh, you know, we were looking and gaining all this knowledge about exporting into the, into the different mar markets during our two year R&D. And uh, also, even the Middle East, uh, we had to go through legislation there to register the products, which was time consuming and expensive as well. Uh, but in order to scale and to grow, I mean, internationally and exporting was the way we wanted to, to uh, scale up. But um, as I said, it is a difficult time because you're spending a lot of money, you have nothing there physical to sell, you know, so a lot of your resources are, go you know, during that two year period, it was difficult until uh, you had, you know, you could gain some sales and get some money back. But, um, I mean, we did at that point have, um, from the AIB, we had, um, you know, an overdraft, which we tried not to dip into. But, um, yeah, it was difficult. But it's all part of the planning and the knowledge uh, because you want to have a product that you can make it easier for yourself even uh, so that when you do seek FDA approval or when you do seek to sell into Canada that you don't have to start changing your packaging or your ingredients, you know, that it is recognised. Obviously, it would be easier if there was a global cosmetic directive. It would make things very simple for us. Um, but that was all part of our planning process, you know, in order to um, internationalise our brand. Even down to the name, because we're based in Spiddle, it's an Irish speaking area here in Galway. So we wanted to have an Irish brand and an Irish name. The Rinamara means King of the Sea. We had to, uh, because we wanted it as Gaelica, we also had to have a name that it could be said, we'll say if it was sitting on a shelf in Germany, that people could still say the name. You know, so even at that point, we had to consider something so simple as the name. You know, but we did want to be recognised as an Irish brand, but we did want it to sit on a shelf anywhere worldwide. I think what you said is really, really interesting. And as academics, we spend, it might be fair to say that we spend a lot of time actually um, investigating what happens to companies and their internationalization. Thank you. Um, once they've formed, and I think that the period, um, the gestation period is where of the company. It is really interesting when a lot of things, you obviously planned well, laid your groundwork well, and you must have had a tight enough hold in the purse strings. Yeah. And I understand that FDA and things like that are very, very expensive. Um, that, that leads me to ask our more tech entrepreneurs, perhaps we'll call them, been, I mean, if, if you want somebody to go down in, in, in the, the vehicles, I mean, I'd love to spin in one of those under, under seat vehicles someday, but they are remote, I think, are they? You don't. Uh, so they're unmanned. Unmanned, uh, okay. Controlled. Um, so some of them are connected to boats, and some of them are what they call autonomous. So, um, Would you trust a woman driver? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I would be interested to hear from, the, and you alluded to this, from the, the technical entrepreneur's perspective. You would have known huge amounts about the tech aspects, yes. um, but what about the more commercial, and I'm very aware I have a CFO sitting here beside me, but um, from the more commercial, how did you gain those resources, those capabilities, and, and bring that knowledge into your company? Um, so I'm probably the most commercial person in the company, and I think when we, so I would have had experience um, both from an academic point up to 1997, and essentially I've worked in startups since 1998. So uh, I think my own experience, you know, I worked with tech entrepreneurs and picked up some of the tricks of the trade, um, but you know, never assumed I knew it all. And I think fundamentally, I think the thing, the thing is, what we said on day one is, well, 
and, and the kind of coaching, you know, as a startup technology that we get as well. What are you selling and how soon and when is the first purchase order going to come in? Because if you sit and say, well, I'm going to spend five years developing something, it's going to cost me 10 million and I have no revenue, then as a founder and an equity holder, um, that really wasn't good enough for me. So I kind of said, well, let's not build all of the things we're planning to build. But we knew on day one, the day we started, we were going to build subsea machine vision automation systems. But we knew it was also going to cost us 10 million. Um, and we only had 500K. So the question was, what could we do? So we actually built lights. And we just built the lights for the vehicles. And we went out selling them. And we talked to everybody. And we got to know the industry and the market and realized, actually, we're going to need an awful lot more than 500K. So we, you know, the investment kind of road, we, we were in the seed corn competition. Uh, we won that in 2009. Um, we kind of went through and had to make decisions in real time. So I suppose as a scientist, and maybe it's just me or the way I'm wired, but I could take, uh, I remember writing a business plan for the South, County, South Dublin County Enterprise Board. We got 75,000 and um, Sean, I can't, Sean McDonald, I think was the guy's name. He took three pages out of it and he said, this is all I need. And it was the p and And I said, How, you know, so I didn't really get it at that time. And I do now, right? And, and, and I think for me, we see the p and as a, not that you can write a plan and it's going to, this is the way it's going to be in three years, but that there's a set of experiments you have to run almost monthly or quarterly at least uh, with that to see, okay, is it going the right way or is it not? And then what is the impact on my decisions in terms of product, in terms of customer, in terms of organization? And then what do I need to do to put those pieces in place? So it's, uh, and that's what external looking at the industries we're in, and it's, it's quite complex, but, 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 but the keystone was, if we're saving oil companies, if we're saving salvage companies, wind farms, hundreds of millions, then somewhere in here is the pot of gold, and let's figure out what are the pieces that we can use to, to get to that. So I think, I don't know if that answers the question, but, but, but it's quite, you know, the commercial side, how do we bring the commercial piece? We kind of started by simplifying the set of experiments to can we actually, can we get somebody to give us a purchase order? Can we get money off something for lights? Uh, and can we break it down into the first thing? Because it's also complex that if, if you don't have the focus on the one thing that's going to bring in some money, you're constantly feeding off investment and eventually going to fall off a cliff. And that's the approach we took. I think you've answered that very comprehensively. And I know that some, some of my fellow academics have heard me talk about the money bit before. And um, I might be accused of being um, mercenary, but to me it's very important, the first purchase order and the actual revenues, etc., not living off perpetual investment, as you talk about. Um, what about our CFO's perspective on um, the commercialization of the company and, and the financial fuel for that? So, yeah, I guess that, that was the primary reason Barry O'Sullivan brought me into AltaCloud, um, pull a business plan together, uh, do a tour of investment houses, but with enormous support from Enterprise Ireland and also here in Galway with the Western Development Commission. And um, they have a, a structured review process that you go through, and if they're happy to invest, that gives a certain amount of comfort to other VCs, um, so we were successful doing a seed round with a number of VCs in Dublin and, and um, WDC Enterprise Ireland and, and a couple of tech investors as well. So um, we had um, done a, a founders, you know, Barry Sullivan, our CEO, calls it the, the four Fs, the friends, the family. Uh, the founders and the fools. Um, so we had done a round to get, you know, the idea, the basis of the product together and present a vision along with uh, numbers of how we can sell, how we're going to market. Um, you know, so initially for that seed round, it was having the, the, the basic product and, and then the vision of how you're going to commercialize it. So for us, for the first two years, it, it, it was primarily direct. And, and selling to customers, um, it was a land and expand strategy. Um, so a number of our customers, it would be a kind of a 10K PO, 
50k production order for 10 users and then the following year growing that to 40 users, 120k production order. So get in the door, prove the product works, expand into other areas. And we've done that a number of times successfully. And um, you know that drove a C plus round for us. We got further funding. Um, so you know KPIs is a big part of you know once you're running from the start, you know, we every month track, you know, marketing through sales, through pilots, bookings, and um, so that you have the stats to back up what you're talking about when it comes to the due diligence with, with um, VCs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that was the first kind of year. I mean, the next stage for us is, is now, uh, we have a number of partnerships that uh, with Cisco, um, Cisco Solutions Plus, Cisco WebEx, a cloud call center company called Five9, Avaya, Amazon, we want Alto Cloud to be the de facto customer journey analytics product. So no matter what calls are in the world, Alto Cloud will be in it. And it's it's monthly recurring revenue. That's 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 what we love. That's music <laughs> As to <CFOs>. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. Um, I want to bring Barry in very quickly because could you tell us a little, Barry, about the actual programs that support the entrepreneurs? Because they've, they've all alluded to um, various sources of funding. And I know that Enterprise Ireland has some very good programs. Okay, so I suppose we have a lot of different audiences that, that we support. So in terms of, let's say, startups. So in terms of startups, um, we, we run, um, or we, we support, I should say, the, uh, and f fund 100% Ireland's National Entrepreneur Programme, which is called New Frontiers. And New Frontiers operates on the campus of each institute of technology around the country. And I'd like to welcome my colleague from the Midlands region, who's my counterpart uh, from Athlone, Mick Brown, who's come to join us this evening. But So, so we have a programme on each campus, 15 campuses around the country. We, we also partner with the Food De Development Board in Ireland, Borbia and Chagask, to run a programme specifically for ambitious food entrepreneurs called Foodworks. We also partner locally here with the university. We're the major funder of a programme called BioInnovation. I think you'll be hearing about that later on. So, so there's a range of programmes. Maybe if I was to give a summary of the planning element for each of those programmes, it would be um, getting the value proposition right. So in other words, why should somebody buy from me? So it goes back to you know, the issues that people you know, have, 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 have outlined here already. Why should somebody buy from me? And having a, a, competitive, a sustainable competitive advantage. We all read about it in Drucker and all of those books. But really having that nobody else has and that you can defend. So that's the first thing. And having got that sustainable advantage, having a really good value proposition, to validate that in the marketplace, to go out and to make sure that people are prepared to put their hands in their pocket and pay you money. So there are sort of two key elements that people coming off the programs will have, um, I suppose, gone through. They'll have a, a, a value proposition that says, look, this is why I'm globally different. And secondly, this is why a customer in Brazil or Germany or Ireland is going to put their hands in their pocket and give me money. So, so they're the two key elements. Then in terms of other programs, um, you know, we, we work with our clients across all elements of the business in terms of strategy, uh, finance, marketing, operations. So, for instance, in terms of operations, we have Ireland's leading authority in the whole area of lean manufacturing, for instance, Dr. Richard Keegan. So, in terms of doing more with less. That's, and, you know, we've come through a very difficult period in Ireland, you know, when the recession came in 2008 and 2009. But by adopting lean principles... Um, the companies that, that we've, we deal with are, have been able to do more with less. They've been able to stretch the euro more and get more value from it. Um, in terms of finance, we run a forum for CFOs called um, Finance for Growth. Um, that happens um, about 12 times a year that rotates between Dublin, Galway and Cork. In terms of sales and marketing, we probably are running Ireland's best program called the International Sales uh, Program. And we, we use a number of different academic partners and commercial partners to help us 
to, to, to develop that programme. We have a programme for um, trying to encourage the ambition level. So in terms of going global, I suppose one of the problems that Ireland has, okay, we're a small nation, so because we're small, companies here have to get off the island at a much earlier stage of their development than an equivalent company in the UK or Germany. So de facto, we're thinking international probably at an earlier stage, but we don't have enough um, companies that are they really want to be global leaders in the area that they're operating in. So you, you know, over the past year, we've introduced a, a, a PR program called Global Ambition, where we're identifying companies all around Ireland that are actually competing and they're world leaders in their own right. And we're using those companies to try and stimulate more companies to say, I want to be a global leader in our own right. But we, 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 over the last seven or eight years, we've pa partnered with Stanford University in the States and running a program called Leadership for Growth, where our, where our uh, CEOs are actually going on a program that is designed specifically for an Irish company in an Irish context, but looking at um, the leadership capabilities that are, are needed for a global company. And several people have come back, many, com many people have come back from that program and they've completely re-engineered re re their company. A, a local company here in Galway um, uh, that employed a couple of hundred people, having com the CEO having completed, com completed the program, thought about their company differently, and they went and acquired a larger company in the States as a result of going on the program, and that company became a much larger company. So there's lots of different programs that we run, but they're all very specific, and they're geared towards largely the leaders and the developers um, you know, of our companies. Brilliant. Thank you, Barry. It's interesting you talk about lean and doing more with less. Um, at, at work at, at Ulster University, we spent some time on Monday with um, our artificial intelligence researchers and we were concentrating on the programme for government in Northern Ireland and, and that recurring theme across most of the advanced economies in terms of public sector efficiencies and um, citizen-centric government. And we were looking at new mis business models and new ways of, of creating um, global micro firms um, in that space in terms of new ways um, of delivering public sector services. So it's a lot of very interesting things happening there. So in the context of Brexit, which is a key issue facing Ireland, one of our responses is lean, and one of our responses is innovation. So just to give you a local example, we, we ran a, a Brexit event in March with the local enterprise offices in this region. And they had a company from Tume, which is about miles up the road. They were only selling in the UK. Uh, um, on the 23rd of June last year, their business fell apart. And luckily, they had been talking with their local enterprise office of doing a lean program. The, the company makes stairs. I'm, I'm, I'm not breaking confidentiality because the company shared this in, in an open forum. So they were doing um, stairs for elderly people, uh, you know, electric stairs. And as a result of Brexit, they focused on the new market, which was the States, right? In addition to that, they focused on lean, trying to be, become more competitive for the UK market. So when they looked, they employed six people. So when they looked at their process, they were able to re-engineer their process. So the packing operation of the stairs was taking two people an hour and a half. And by taking in a lean consultant, they were able to uh, turn that process into a 10-minute operation for one person. So you can see the competitiveness of the company immediately becoming. So uh, 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 back in March, you know, nine months after Brexit, they had regained the business that they had in the UK, and they'd already gained the same level of business that they had in the UK in the States. So they were a more competitive business, and they had um, moved into a new market, which is a fantastic outcome for a company facing the prospect of Brexit. I'm glad to hear some positive aspects of Brexit, Barry. <laughs> I promised not to use the B word. <laughs> this evening. <laughs> um, but I'm glad you did, because that, that's a good news story. Um, I'm conscious that we want to leave some time for our um, delegates to ask questions. But in, in terms of, we've heard lots of good stuff, and I think we could have a conversation for the entire evening here. And um, if somebody were to bring you know, the porter from the porter shed back, we probably would be here all evening. But what, what, for each of you, what's the biggest challenge facing you now, right now today, in term, for your businesses? For Alto Cloud, it's it's opening the lock on those partners. We we have the agreement signed, but the money just doesn't roll in automatically. So it's it's you know with five nine when we started six months ago, we had a, have had a guy camped in their office every week, 
getting to know the sales reps, getting the relevant material, training them on demos, and it's now starting to work. So we're gonna to have to do the same with Cisco to open the lock on that solutions plus. So, you know, it's it's keeping the push in sales. Um, we're, we're a tech company, so we, you know, we do have VC financing that has a limited life. So we need the sales, the revenue to kick in, and, and it's, you know, doing everything we can to facilitate that. Well, Barry's and Anne's talked about the, the sales um, programs, etc., and the importance of sales is, is paramount, of course. Um, thank you for that. And Deirdre, for yourself? I suppose uh, the cosmetic industry is very competitive worldwide, and one of the challenges is that we're, as an SME, we're pitching against um, huge companies who have massive marketing budgets, and so you have to be very creative about your marketing and to build your brand worldwide with a lot smaller of a budget. Um, I think that's the emergence of the internet when we began, and how we use our website at the moment as well um, allows you to grow internationally and to build your brand, and even the use of social media, and that means that you can pitch against some of the companies now, um, as I said, some of the large cosmetic companies might go into some of the uh, sales channels. They provide bonuses for, for the staff. They can kit out the whole shop. You're never going to be, be able to compete on that level as an SME. But um, I find that a lot of customers, they want to know the providence of their product now. So they want to see the people behind the product. They want to know where the ingredients are from, where... Uh, you know the formulations when it comes to skincare products. They want to know, uh, you know, to be able to track every single bit of the process, the manufacturing process. So I think that uh, we recently upgraded our website, the Rena Meyer website, and uh, to show people who wanted to see our process and uh, to help build the brand. So I think that's a big challenge as an SMA globally is uh, when you don't have the same marketing budgets and how you can be creative to try and achieve and grow those sales internationally. Thank you, Deirdre. And I know that's a theme that some of um, my colleagues have actually researched along about brand awareness and reputational signalling and, and such like for small companies. And we do um, acknowledge how difficult it can be. But they're clearly doing something for you now, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the, the sales and whatever. And yourself, Adrian. And I think for Catholics, my That's really interesting. Um, we spoke recently to a company, and again, I'm not breaking confidence, called Text Help in Northern Ireland, Antrim, who are a software company. They make educational assistive software, and they faced exactly the same cha challenges. They're somewhat older than yourselves, but went down a similar pathway. And um, at around 40 employees, the founding team found that they had to change how things worked, and, and they talked about the critical hires. Um, people like chief financial officers to run this side of the business, and um, business improvement and, and spans of communication and, and such like. So it's, it was challenging, but um, you'll get there just like they did. Um, the, very briefly, because I've got to let these people ask some questions, the very biggest challenge facing Enterprise Ireland today, Barry? It's Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, but I, I understand. No, it's very serious. Um, yeah. Like we see Brexit has been probably the biggest challenge facing Ireland over the last 50 years. Um, 
we now have 34% of our exports uh, going to the UK. Uh, we, we, we want to see that reduced. Uh, we have a target in Enterprise Ireland to increase our exports to mainland Europe by 50% by 2020. Um, so, you know, we have lots of actions underway within the organisation to, um, I suppose, we, we, you know, to, to, to deal with Brexit and, uh, and our response is around a number of theme areas, innovation, competitiveness, um, strategic issues including currency and, uh, um, and lean and market diversification. So just to give you an insight, uh, next week we'll have ex executives back from each of our 32 offices outside of Ireland. We'll have about uh, maybe between 60 and 70 different market desks um, in a location in Dublin where over 500 clients of ours will be able to come and talk about moving into new markets. We'll also have a Brexit zone. Uh, that Brexit zone will be broken into um, areas like procurement, uh, logistics, supply chain. Um, so in summary, the biggest issue facing Enterprise Ireland as an agency is Brexit at the moment. Thank you, Barry. I kind of promised not to speak about Brexit, and I'm not going to get in my feet and talk about Brexit, but the integration of the supply chains on the island and the challenges, and we've literally just finished um, a survey with small companies, SMEs, um, in Northern Ireland, and it's woeful to tell you how few have put in place any Brexit-proofing plans at all. The, the, or the uncertainty, I suppose it's a bit of a head in the sand mentality right now. They don't know and they feel they can't plan, which is really, really very alarming, especially in the agri-food sector. So um, thank you very much. I'm sure these people are just itching to ask some questions. Hands up, we'll put the mic over to you. Well, you're thinking about some questions. Um, a couple of things I did want to say, Altitloud being a tech, a SaaS company, you know, when you're thinking about your product from day one, um, and you're thinking, you know, this is born global, uh, think about security. Um, Altitloud are SOC 2 compliance, uh, compliant. Uh, so it gives our customers, call centers, comfort that our data is is secure with these guys. Uh, the other thing to, to think about is um, GDPR. Where are we going to host the data? So our US is a big market. We have we're cloud-based AWS. We have a US data center for you customers. We have an EU data center. So you need to think about that from the start and get the processes in place from the beginning. So when you do want to do your SOC 2 tests, that it's not a lot of work and you don't have to redo things, development, more time, more money. Um, and just from an Irish tax perspective, you know, uh, we, we're an Irish company. Uh, to be Irish based is very tax efficient, 12.5% corporation tax here. Uh, so for any, any Irish entrepreneurs that are setting up, be an Irish company, set up your subsidiary abroad when you're re ready for the revenues to grow, get your transfer pricing agreements in place for your own shareholding, put a holding company in place. You know, there are some benefits here for entrepreneur relief, but uh, try not give too much to the government. <laughs> EI, EI is spending it all on them. Um, but it's, it's they're just some items that Irish entrepreneurs should think about, but also European, because GDPR is definitely a huge one on, on the tech side, and, and SOC 2 compliance if you want to operate in the States. Okay. Right. Hamid has a question here. I just want to break the ice. The very first question is uh, to Madam uh, Kathoyed. Um, Rina Mara, I, as a professor of marketing, I really appreciate the fact that you selected a brand name that is reflective and is Irish and Thank is you. easy to pronounce. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, well, it, it was important as an Irish brand and to be proud that we're an Irish brand and to promote it worldwide. 
and being from the Gael Tact, um, it was important that it was at Gaelic. But um, yeah, and from a marketing point of view, it has to, you have to be able to say it, whether you're German or any nationality. So uh, it seems to have worked okay. We were very, you know, persistent, persistent, um, you know, to stick with our Irish language. Thank you. Excellent. I have two parts question. The first one is FDA uh, approval. Okay. Did you go through that, that process yourself or uh, did you invite or uh, hire consulting companies to help you? That's the no. first one. Yeah. And the second one is uh, somewhat as a professor of marketing and international business, I'm always concerned about L'Oreal. So are you afraid of them? Are you competing with them? <laughs> or do you invite them to take you over? Well, if they want to uh, buy me out of the company, <laughs> I'd be very willing to talk to them. But um, regarding the FDA, uh, no, we had to do that process ourselves. Uh, so you do have to gain all this knowledge, you know, which is not um, in your background, maybe. But um, yeah, we had we had to uh, go out and uh, provide all the information and go through the process. It did take about six to eight months, um, which we thought was a lot until we went to the United Arab Emirates and to register there, and it took two years. And it was over 2,000 euro to register the products. So um, it, it just would make it easier if there was a global cosmetic directive and, you know, it would simplify everything. Uh, regarding the L'Oreal, um, they're just so massive, some of the, the cosmetic companies. And um, thankfully, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of customers want to know the face behind the brand. They want to know where those extracts that you're putting into the creams or skincare that they're adding to their skin or you know their lotions they want to know where they're coming from so they do they want to know the providence and that's where um, you know we have a competitive advantage i would say because they can come on our website they contact us we get emails worldwide and also in the emergence of the social media uh, we've tried to embrace it so that people can contact us and uh, if they have any questions they're there's that personal touch, which the larger companies they, they just seem to be failing on the you know in their digital marketing and their um, their social media. But um, I'd still be happy to talk to them if they wanted to well, <laughs> invest. Sharon, would you allow me to ask a, a pitch a question to the panel? Uh, Mr. Egan actually referred to uh, Brexit as a challenge. Uh, my question is really related to the events which are coming with some expectations. Canadians are coming, uh, Canada, Europe, uh, free trade uh, is just about to be approved, Japanese are in line. So the question is specifically to uh, uh, Irish enterprises, but in general to the panel. Are you thinking of the scenarios which are just evolving and unfolding? and preparing for them or not? No. <laughs> I think we're so, so caught up in the here and now, and like certainly for our company, it's, kind of, it's not the most immediate, most urgent thing. Um, I'm sure we'll have some bearing on the business, but not in a way that we can predict or foresee over the next 12 months. And we already deal with all the countries. If trade agreements change, our prices might change. So for our particular business, it's a right now no. Yeah, in terms of scenarios, um, we're actually running an event in Dublin in a couple of weeks' time on scenario planning. So we're going to take companies through different possibilities, and there will be actually a game board element to that. So we're trying to bring a fun, but there's obviously a very serious part. So to answer your question, yes, we are looking at scenarios, um, we, and this is the first. But we have we've already done a series of Brexit events all around the country. Uh, we have a number of different supports already in place. We have a Brexit scorecard available where people can see how Brexit ready they are, you know, on our <coughs> website. That the, the engine behind that is also available to the local enterprise offices in each county in Ireland. Um, and, and you know it's fine-tuned to their times, but you know we develop the engine. Uh, we also have a number of specific Brexit supports, but 
you know, it, it's hard to know um, exactly what's going to happen. But in terms of to answer a specific question, yes, we are helping our clients to prepare for different scenarios. I'll make an admission that I've been directing people to your website in the north as well. So, don't go back. It will be available. Yeah. <laughs> because we don't have as valuable a tool at the moment. Um, I think. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Arif Zaman from the London School of Business and Management. Just wanted to go back to Dietrich. Don't want to sort of concentrate too much. Um, I mean, the, the very striking, I think you picked this up, um, Sharon, in your remarks, your um, approach to R&D in, in um, getting your business going in the early stages was very clear. So my question is, how do you sustain that? in the context of two things. One is, well, three things perhaps. One is that you're from Ireland, so a small country perhaps. Also that you're a woman entrepreneur. And thirdly, that the dynamic is changing so fast and so furiously in terms of you know, the research space, whether it's through technology or whatever. So you know, very important, clearly at the outset, now that you're established and that you're growing and you're looking to grow further, how, what, what are you doing to ensure that your R&D is embedded in what you do moving forward? Uh, in the cosmetics industry, you have to follow, you have to look at the trends and you have to look at your, you know, market knowledge is key. Uh, I think it's all about knowledge, really, to answer your question, you know. Um, Again, the emergence of the internet, and in those 14 years, we have uh, redeveloped our website three times to make it internationally, um, you know, easier to use and to make it quick and fast. So things are changing really quickly, and you do have to keep abreast of all the trends. And I think the most important person to me is my customer, is the end user, and to keep in close contact and to listen to them um, is the most important thing in my business because that's where my sales is coming from. So if I have a happy customer. I have a customer who's going to be an advocate for my product, so um, they're the people that I listen to, and if they, they're they usually pretty good at telling you if they want something new or they want, you know, so listening to your, your um, customer is very important, and to seek as much knowledge about your new marketplace as you can. Uh, for example, when I talked about the United Arab Emirates, um, we did have to adapt some of our products because we looked at the uh, marketplace there and there were certain products because of the warm climate and that our facial moisturizer sells really well. We brought out an oil, a facial oil, because of the hot climate, the condition, you know, the various impacts of that. So I think adapting your products, expanding your products, bring new products um, on definitely the knowledge and listening to your customer is is the most important way I think uh, to try and grow and build the brand and let them be the advocate of your brand thank you Deirdre you're bringing theory to life here the panel all of you have brought international marketing and international business theory to life I think I'm the closest here Hello, um, uh, my name is Khalid Hafiz. I'm from University of Alberta, Dundee. Uh, I want to bring uh, uh, attention to a startup where we started from, like Born Global. So uh, my question to the panel is that uh, you talk about uh, you were thinking about going global from right from the start, from your strategy point of view and so on. Uh, but did uh, what I want to ask is, did the social network side of it, did it help you at all? Or it was all purely on the opportunist side that you got an opportunity, you started to export? Or it was a born in terms of some innate network analysis or something which you had in terms of global network which helped you in terms of going global? What for our, um, our CEO, our CTO, our Ex Cisco employees. It's the biggest, one of the biggest call center companies in the world. So uh, from the off, they knew the Cisco network, they knew the people uh, to, um, that could bring AltaCloud in, that could, you know, promote our brand internally. So it, it definitely was a personal connection. But since so they're only one customer. Um, so since then, it's been at conferences, uh, making yourself known. What, what has helped us enormously is 
thinking global from the start. So when we do a lot of our tweeting and PR, we would say our HQ is in Mountain View, so all the US customers think that we're Silicon Valley type company. Ireland is just a development center. Um, you know, so it's that think global, your global messaging, how you present yourself, do it from the start. Um, don't present yourself as a small Irish company. Present yourself as Silicon Valley tech company. We're revolutionizing call centers. Uh, and that helped us, you know, with 5.9, the biggest cloud call center company in the world, Avaya, Amazon. We're talking about Amazon at the moment. So a um, bit personal to start, and then you're kind of on your own after that to, to, to build a wider network. Adrian, for, for you, how did that work? Because yours is a very nation based, very sm small number of lead clients and lead. Yeah, so when we started out, um, I remember giving a pitch to uh, some of Barry's colleagues in Enterprise Ireland. Um, we started out in Tala IT in an incubation centre, and there was a guy called John O'Dea um, who was over the HPSU unit. And it just turned out John worked in offshore oil and gas in his youth and happened to know a few people. Um, and he introduced me to two of them, and two of them ran two of the biggest offshore services companies in the world with combined revenues of 15 billion between them. They invested in Cathex and introduced us to everybody. And the network, fundamentally, the most valuable asset we had from day one was the network that these guys opened for us. And when you look at the offshore industry and the engineering, if you look at BP, an oil company, you know, the senior management, the chief operating officer, Bernard Looney, is Ken Mayer, Mike Daly, the Irish network has been phenomenal for us, and everybody offers to help out, and I expect they would see the same thing. You know, pick up a phone, talk to him, talk to him, and it's a huge part of it because, you know, like if I go to Houston, we don't just go to see one, peop one person. The Enterprise Ireland offices are instrumental in that. Um, like, I remember being in a coffee shop in Perth last year, and I bumped into a guy in the coffee shop who was the CFO of Sime Industries, who came from Dublin, and you know it was through the Enterprise Ireland office that we kind of developed those relationships, and they're huge, you know, because how do you get the lead? How do you get in to make the pitch to the companies at the right level, the senior level, at the technical level, and all of that? And it's hard work, but but that network is absolutely instrumental to, like I think we we, we probably would have failed three years ago if we hadn't had access to the network we got through the guys we met on day one. I think it would be fair to say that uh, the Irish on the island are good networkers and I've certainly seen Enterprise Ireland in action over the years in all sorts of far-flung places and they certainly are superb networkers and facilitators of networkers, of networks. We would have one more question. Yeah, I think I have two questions. One for uh, the government representative and then one for, I mean, the, the, the other entrepreneurs talking about networks. Uh, is, it, is it only the Irish network which seems to be very valuable? Uh, because you, uh, cosmetic this, and you went to America or wherever. Uh, how did you go there? I mean, didn't you have any, anybody in America uh, being helpful to you? Or you just went into the market and then started working there? Um, well, that uh, actually there is a business n network in America, you know, with um, a lot of Irish expats. Wow. So um, it makes it a lot easier when you're Irish, I suppose. But um, we started by going to trade shows. Uh, we targeted different trade shows uh, throughout, you know, Los Angeles, Chicago and New York, and I attended the trade shows. This was to enable me to meet a distributor, you know, a distributor so that they would um, sell our products in the different channels. And, um, but th there's also the Milwaukee Irish Fest, which was mainly an Irish, you know, uh, people and clientele that attended it and that was fabulous for us because I still have people who buy online and this 14 years since I went to that show. Um, so I think it's great if there is a network and there is people in the different countries that you can touch base with and get introductions and um, again Enterprise Ireland is very good at that and um, making the introductions but um, yeah we, we had to consistently attend these trade shows 
before we got the distributor that fitted uh, our company, you know, because it's important to be able to build a relationship with that distributor and um, f for them, you know, for you to feel confident that they'll portray and sell your product as well as you can. Um, but yeah, it, it's a lot of groundwork to attend all the trade shows continuously before you establish, um, you know, the right distributor. But that's how we approach the American market. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now to the government representative. Uh, most critics about government helping companies uh, about government tending to subsidize companies and. If it is Irish or America or anywhere, China or India, you see their competitors from elsewhere blaming their less competitiveness on government, I mean, creating no level playing ground because governments are subsidizing companies. What you are doing, will you be able to know that what you are doing is just supporting them to be on their own or you subsidize them just to be competitive on the, on the, on the foreign market. Yeah, our, I suppose our focus is international markets. So we, we, we don't fund companies to, to do business only in Ireland. Mm. So our policy is only to support companies to um, export. And we support companies in a range of different ways. We provide advice, assistance. So even coming back to networks, um, for instance, we have a network of over 400 mentors, and that network, um, many of the mentors have actually bought and sold companies, so they're very experienced people, and our companies can tap into that experience. Okay. Um, but so, so we provide advice, support, information. We, prob we, we probably have Ireland's best um, research center for business in terms of intelligence, so we have access to international uh, market reports, we then provide um, financial assistance both by way of investment and also by way of grant. So in terms of investment, the, our, our, our strategy for startups is we put money in by way of investment. So very often we're the first investor and that, that investment will lever other people to come in and invest. Now, I said earlier that we, we are active in the support for risk money. So we have, we're probably the main instigator of the creation of a venture capital market in Ireland. We started that back in 1986. So we've been um, supporting venture capital and the development of venture capital, and they, they invest at arm's length. So we will never invest more than 50% um, of the total investment in a company and very often less. So, uh, and we take up to 10% equity um, and our, our payback so we would be probably our, so we were probably Europe's largest VC investor, Enterprise Ireland, and so we're doing that by way of um, uh, investment of taking ordinary shares up to 10%. So then in terms of grant, so we're, we're supporting the creation of new technologies, um, uh, new jobs in Ireland, um, and it's outside of Ireland, and we're obviously bound by EU rules. So we're obviously, uh, you know, all of our schemes and support are, are are robust versus uh, EU rules. So our, our business really is to try and enable companies to create um, unique positions and innovative positions and we're supporting even the companies, the startups that we support, we're looking for innovation so that there, there aren't me too products or companies out there. So we, we are trying to create additionality, I suppose, in the world. Thank you, Barry. I think I'm getting a red card from Natasha here and that we probably have in the conversation okay. um, basically we have a short break for some more refreshments um, there is a second panel with a different set of entrepreneurs and support agencies uh, after the short break and